Hi, everyone, and welcome to another Pine Bush Science Lecture. I'm Richard Naylor from the Friends of the Pine Bush Community, and we co-sponsor with commission staff our monthly science lecture webinars. So tonight, as questions occur to you during the presentation, which is the effects of prescribed fire on ticks in a pine barrens landscape, we suggest that you use the Q&A option at the bottom of the screen. Uh, the chat's okay, but the Q&A works really well for us. Uh, just type your question. Dylan will see the questions and provide them to our presenter at the end. And if you have a laptop or desktop and you haven't used Zoom much, you may have to move your mouse down to the bottom for the chat thing to show up. And if it's a iPad, I'm totally mis mystified, but I think you hover over it or you swipe up or something. So as usual, uh, we will not have a December science lecture again this year. Uh, we skip that every year, but we will be planning for them in the coming months. And you can always find uh, them at the website at albanypinebush.org. Uh, you can also find out about upcoming programs, get trail information, uh, check out to make sure everything is good with the trail if you're planning a big thing and find out other information about the Pine Bush Preserve. So now, without further ado, back to you, Dylan. Thanks so much, Richard. Thanks, nice to see you, Mike. Nice to see you too. All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Um, my name is Dylan, I'm the field ecologist and entomologist with the Albany Pine Bush Preserve, um, and I facilitate our science lecture series. Um, and again, thank you to everyone for making this such a success as we've changed to our digital format um, for our lecture series. Um, it's my great privilege tonight to introduce our speaker, um, Dr. Michael, Michael Gallagher. Um, Mike is a research ecologist um, with the uh, US Forest Service. Um, he's worked there for 12 years. Um, he works in the climate, fire, and um, carbon cycle sciences unit. Um, but he, before that, he got his bachelor's of, bachelor's of science degree in ecology and natural resources at Rutgers. Um, he stayed on at Rutgers for, to complete his PhD work um, where he looked at um, fire effects in the New Jersey Pine Barrens, um, comparing field um, methods and satellite imagery for um, mapping fire effects. Um, and speaking of fire, uh, Mike is also a wildland firefighter. Um, so he's helped with uh, prescribed burns and wildfires around the country. He's helped with prescribed burns in the Albany Pine Bush Preserve. Um, and he's been to about a dozen states. He actually just got back from a deployment out west helping fight um, fires in South Dakota and Wyoming. Um, at Bighorn National Forest, um, let's see, I can't read my writing, Custer's National Park, and what was the cave one? It was uh, Wind Cave and Custer State Park. Uh, they're cave. next to each other in, in the Badlands of South Dakota. Awesome. So thank you so much for your service helping us fight wildfire. Um, and we're very much looking forward to hearing about your work with um, prescribed fire and ticks tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, let me just share my screen here. All right. So um, before I get started, I'll, I'll give you a little bit more background on myself. Um, um, I, I started off my career, well, I'll start off by saying I am not a tick expert. Um, ticks are something that I've come into studying recently um, for a couple of reasons, um, but they relate to a lot of other things that I've studied over the years. Um, so I started my research uh, in 2008, uh, right after undergraduate, with uh, the U.S. Forest Service Northern Research Station, Silas Little Experimental Forest. And the Silas Little Experimental Forest is in the New Jersey Pine Barrens. Um, so it's a similar but bigger landscape uh, compared to the Albany Pine Bush Preserve. And that research station was established in uh, the 1930s to study forest fire as a representative location for the Northeast um, because forest fire problems in this part of the country at the time were among the worst. Um, today you'll read about uh, um, California quite a bit or the Great Basin area quite a bit um, in the news about fires. And at that time, they really weren't burning that much. It was the Northeast. And so um, the fire research program that I'm a part of 
uh, has had a really interesting trajectory over time. Um, and it's actually uh, the oldest fire research program in the country um, that we're aware of. We've been saying that we can't find anybody else that um, is willing to challenge us. Um, so, so that's pretty cool. Um, so I started off doing carbon flux research and looking at how uh, forest and forest disturbances would um, impact the amount of carbon up uh, taken up by forests and, and how much trees would grow um, and, and how those things might interact over time. And so through that, I learned a lot about micrometeorology because we use uh, basically fancy weather equipment to help estimate how much uh, biome or how much carbon dioxide trees are taking up and to estimate the conditions basically that add to photosynthesis or, or respiration. So the, the uptake or the release of um, moisture and, and uh, carbon dioxide and oxygen from the forest. As my career kind of grew, um, we started using those things more and more for fire. And I could show you a quick um, couple slides of a presentation I gave recently showing if I can get this to, well, that doesn't seem to want to work. Um, but basically using these, these setups and we'd fireproof these weather setups and put them in forests and burn them to understand how fire behaves during prescribed fires. Um, now we're applying that to ticks and fire. And so, um, like I said, this is new. Most of my other work focuses on, ha on how fires burn through forests and how forest structure influences forest fires and prescribed burns um, and how those prescribed burns then change the forest conditions. But those things also I found really relate to ticks and fire quite well. So this project is a collaborative project between the US Forest Service and Penn State University. Uh, my colleague, Jesse Cry out there has been an um, equal partner in this project. Um, and it's also been supported by Andrea Gizzi, who's a, um, a tick and mosquito specialist at Rutgers, Jeremy Weber of New Jersey Forest Fire Service, uh, Dr. Nick Skaronsky of the US Forest Service, and uh, Lexi Everland of Tall Timbers, and Nathaniel Schmidt, uh, who, who's a uh, technician at Penn State. And so um, each person on a team brings a different talent to our program. If, um, if you're not aware, uh, the Northeastern United States is, is the mecca of ticks right now in the country. There's a lot of ticks in other places, um, but uh, we have quite a lot of ticks and quite a lot of tick-borne diseases. Um, after mosquitoes, ticks are the number one uh, um, vector of um, disease as far as uh, insects and arthropods go. Um, in the Northeast, there are, or in the US, there's about, um, about 13 different uh, diseases present, depending on where you're at, that are vectored by a handful of different ticks. Um, everyone focuses on Lyme disease that gets a lot of attention and Lyme disease uh, does cause some pretty serious problems, but um, these other diseases can also really ruin your day or your life, um, and they're worth considering. Uh, I also wanted to just point out that uh, we have heartland virus here and bourbon uh, virus disease. Um, we haven't heard a whole lot about them. They just popped up uh, in the past few years uh, down south. They're not in the Northeast yet. Um, but they are uh, vectored by some ticks that do occur in the Northeast. So not only are, are ticks a big issue, but we're finding new diseases and some of those disease ranges are changing. Um, <clears throat> also over the past 10 to 20 years, the number of reported cases has really risen. <clears throat> Part of this is because we know a lot more about tick-borne diseases, so we're paying attention to them more. There's a lot more public awareness. But the number of tick-borne cases um, has, has reported each year has, has had a definite upward trend. Um, 
And as I mentioned, there's some new diseases or, or ones that are gaining more attention. Um, babesiosis, for instance, um, really only started getting uh, tracked within the past 15 years or so. Um, <clears throat> on the left here, this figure just shows some of the primary tick-borne diseases and how their numbers have, have changed. So cumulatively, there's a lot more numbers coming up over time. A another important consideration of, of ticks is that uh, they're not just a human problem. They're a big issue for livestock, um, for wildlife. Um, deer get a lot of ticks. Uh, there are some ticks that are uh, pretty particular um, or some tick-borne diseases that are particular to some wildlife. Also though, our, our pets uh, are getting tick-borne diseases more and more. Um, and then of course, everyone loves their fur babies. And so that's actually um, a, a really important issue too because of the amount of money people are spending um, to, to take care of their pets uh, once they get sick. Um, so Nathaniel, um, who is one of our, our collaborators actually has a veterinary background and, and that was his interest in ticks to begin with was all the cases of tick-borne diseases that he was seeing in uh, domestic animals. <clears throat> um, so to make matters worse, uh, the ranges of ticks is also starting to change. Um, these two maps are basically highlighting how the species ranges of the black-legged tick, or you might know it as the deer tick, um, have been expanding really in the past uh, 20 years or so. Uh, the black-legged tick range is forecasted to continue expanding over the next couple decades. Um, so these are some uh, projections based on climate change models. And sometimes, um, I don't know about you, I, I see project, project, uh, predictions with these models quite often and they'll say, well, at the end of the century, this is gonna happen, or that's gonna happen. But um, these projections are within the next two decades, really. So within our lifetimes, um, you know, black-legged tick populations are very likely to move farther north. Um, and that will impact uh, areas north of the Albany Pine Bush Preserve. So the other tick to look out for, um, that you may or may not think a lot about is the Lone Star Tick. Um, Lone Star Tick has historically been thought of as, I think, more of a southern or coastal tick species. It doesn't carry Lyme disease, um, whereas the black-legged tick does, but it does carry some other um, diseases that are, are of significant concern. And so this map on the left, uh, these dots represent where the Lone Star Tick is presently. And then the map on the right shows in red where the Lone Star Tick is predicted to move north to. Um, and the green is actually where it's gonna lose range. So um, as conditions continue to change, um, the whole species is expected to move northward. And uh, that's probably good if you live in Florida, but not so great if you're not used to that tick in your neighborhood. So my um, involvement with ticks kind of came up through a, um, I don't know if it was a fortuitous plan of mine that ended in bad circumstances or what, but this map uh, on the right here is a picture of uh, burn severity or, or the magnitude of ecological change after a big fire project that we did in the New Jersey Pine Barrens. Picture on the left is a picture of our prescribed fire. And the red areas of the map are where the, the fire burned worse, and the green areas of, are where the fire didn't really burn quite as hot. This black circle in the middle, the hole of the donut, as I like to call it, is an area that I argued with my fire manager friend uh, right by this weather station not to burn, because being a scientist, I was out there helping him with this burn, but I wanted to keep a little piece unburnt for comparison. And just for reference, the other unburned area there is actually all old cranberry bog. So it's all wet and not non-forest. And so um, I don't know, after some, some arguing back and forth, friendly arguing, he decided to let me keep this 80 acres 
unburnt so I could um, compare it with some of the other burned area. And I went out um, a few months later in February to uh, take a look at it. And it was kind of a warm day. And I'll tell you, it was covered in ticks in there like I haven't seen. But I don't usually spend a lot of time in unburnt forest. I'm always in burned area. And for the first time, I think in my life, I had a deer tick that embedded itself and I just couldn't uh, get it out. And um, long story short, I, I also got some other ticks on me. I ended up with babesiosis and Rocky Mountain spotted fever, um, either from that instance or from a combination of previous instances. And neither one of these diseases were really on my radar. Um, and so I got, I got sick slowly and um, it, it really kind of messed with my, um, my mental awareness of things. And, and I just felt really foggy. And um, it, I, was, I was just confused about what was going on. And I finally uh, got tested and, and um, thought, you know, maybe, maybe I got something from these ticks. And, and anyway, I had two diseases. So um, it, it really kind of put a damper on my life for a few months. And it, it really resonated um, with me, all these previous stories I'd heard from friends and colleagues who had had Lyme disease or tick-borne disease and um, just how frustrating and, and um, for some people pretty debilitating it can be. And what also stood out was the striking number of ticks that were in this unburnt area versus the burned areas that I was used to working in. Um, and I had noticed that throughout the rest of the burned area at this preserve, there really weren't any ticks that I was seeing. So um, we, we started a study. Um, Jesse, the other co I and I, um, were at a meeting in a, uh, Albuquerque. And we, we were talking about this at the meeting. And we decided to cut out and go camping for a day and think about like forests and, and how things burn and um, if we could come up with a tick project. And, Basically, over two days, we, we came up with this tick project, came home and started it about a week later. And the basic premise of the project is linking fire with all these different things that impact tick populations. So this is a conceptual diagram of with fire in the middle here and tick populations in the bottom right of how fire impacts all these different things that impact tick populations. So. Um, Fire is going to modify vegetation, and vegetation is going to impact hosts and predators. Um, so when you change the vegetation structure, animals have different um, behaviors. They might be able to hide better in unburnt area, or they might prefer the food in a burned area. In any event, that impacts the, the hosts and predator um, uh, dynamics in that area, both of which carry ticks. So again, that comes back to tick populations. Um, also, microclimate is going to be modified by fire. Um, a area that has a lot of black material in it is going to absorb a lot more energy, just like the pavement outside in the summer absorbs more heat than the uh, cement on the sidewalk. Um, and in turn, that will impact vegetation and soil, um, which are also important components of tick habitat. And these different aspects of fire that change aren't um, binary. They're not just burned or unburned, but they actually vary quite a bit with the frequency of fire that occurs in an area and the, um, the severity. So um, again, it's not just burned or unburned, but you could have a really uh, ripping fire that burns the, the pine needles and the leaves all the way up to the tree tops, or you could have a really low severity fire that you might not even realize happened if you went out a month or two later after everything greens back up. And then the seasonality of fire is really important too. So ticks aren't really uh, going to be in quite the same abundances at all different times of year. Uh, when they're different life cycle stages, basically young ticks or old ticks, they have different behaviors and things that they're doing. Th they're gonna spend different amounts of time above ground or hiding out in the soil, um, depending on the season. Um, and whether it's in general winter or the growing season. So all these attributes of fire um, are, are really quite complicated and intricate, and there's not a whole ton of research on how fire and tick populations might 
interact. So for a little background on this, um, this is a map here on the left that Mike Stambaugh um, and Brian Sturdivant, um, uh, sorry, Mike Stambaugh and Dan Day put together um, a few years ago that's supposed to reflect the historic fire frequencies in the United States. So in the past century, fire frequency has actually declined substantially um, throughout much of the Eastern US and especially in the Northeast. With, because of fire suppression and reduced uh, prescribed burning. These maps on the right here, or these figures on the right, basically show a downward trend. Um, the numbers are small, but basically there's a lot of stuff going on at the left around 1900 and less going on as you get to the right. And the, both of these figures show the numbers of fires or the acreages burned in New Hampshire and Maine and New Jersey. So over time, Fire has really diminished a whole lot in the Northeast and the states that, that we live in. And if you look back to the map on the left here, you can see that the dark, darkest yellow uh, areas down by Florida had fire frequencies of, of greater than every two years. So the, the, these whole regions burned much more uh, all the way up to Southern New Jersey, which had fire frequencies of approximately six to eight years, um, maybe going up to as much as every 10 years, and um, even in parts of New York and um, Pennsylvania and Massachusetts and Connecticut there. Um, now, presently, a lot of places have fire return intervals that exceed 50 years. Um, so we might see a prescribed burn here or a little wildfire there, but it's not happening um, at any kind of frequency that compares to the historic fire frequency. So that might have something to do with ticks. If the forest isn't burning as much as it used to and fire impacts tick populations and habitat, um, this drastic change um, could be an interesting uh, linkage there. Um, these lines also delineate where the Lone Star tick range um, presently is. The, the dark line is, is the present range extent and the gray line is where Lone Star ticks are predicted to move up to in the future. And so below that dark gray line, everywhere below that burned a lot more um, prior to, to present day, prior to the past century than it has recently. So these tick populations and the change in fire frequencies overlap a lot. The first person probably to be called a, a tick researcher um, was this fellow named Peter Kalm. Um, he was a Swedish scientist. Um, and he wrote the first account of uh, ticks in the United States um, scientifically in the area of southern New Jersey and, and Delaware and Pennsylvania that used to be called New Sweden before, um, before we were a country. And he wrote in his uh, documentation of an interview with locals who said that the government in the 17... 20s, I believe it was, had uh, banned the use of uh, broadcast burning. And since then, they would had tick problems. Um, and they were frustrated because they couldn't burn their forest anymore. The, the government was concerned that they were killing all of the seedlings and saplings, and there wouldn't be enough regeneration of future trees. Um, but this was, uh, according to the locals, having a major impact on ticks. Um, if you move forward into the, the early 1900s, there was a fellow down at um, Paul Timbers Research Station in Tallahassee, Florida, who wrote about uh, the importance of burning uh, quite a bit. That's the, a, another very old fire research station down there. And uh, he wrote quite a bit about uh, fire and Bob White quail. And throughout his, his writings, there's scattered little bits here and there about the reduction of ticks from burning all the way down there. Um, otherwise, you kind of have to go to, to fairly recent times to, to learn anything about fire and ticks in the literature. Um, there was a really neat study in 2014 by Dr. Elizabeth Gleam, who's now at Hollis University. Um, and she showed that uh, prescribed burning actually did reduce ticks. There was a lot of debate about whether it, it increased them or decreased them or was indifferent. But at least in a, a pine dominated forest landscape, 
she found that prescribed fire uh, not only reduced ticks in the burned areas, but uh, caused an effect in the adjacent unburned forest areas, which was really interesting. So um, again, I'm just gonna highlight that fire effects vary spatially. So um, these are just some ideas of spatial scale of pictures from some of my other research projects that aren't focused on ticks. Um, you could have a really ripping tiny fire like the one on the left. You could have a bigger fire, but that's not uh, really that hot. Um, and then across the landscape, this picture on the right is an area of about 3,500 acres that burned. And the different coloration, the brighter colors relate to a, a, a more severe impact where the entire canopy was consumed. And the purple relates to areas where there was very little damage from the fire. And so these, these spatial differences in fire um, really highlight the fact that fire is not just burned and unburned, but there's a lot of quality to it. So we sought out to answer uh, just a couple key questions really about how dormant season fire, which is the most common fire um, in New Jersey for us, um, how dormant season fire might impact tick populations, their habitat, and the prevalence of tick-borne diseases. So building off of Elizabeth Gleam's research, how can we look a little deeper into how this works mechanistically? So our research focused in the New Jersey Pine Barrens. Um, the Pine Barrens is a, about a 1.5 million acre um, international biosphere reserve. Um, it has a long history of large wildfires. Um, ranging anywhere from very small to um, hundreds of thousands of acres historically. Um, in the past 50 years, our largest fire was 25,000 acres. We had an 11,000 acre fire um, a year ago, the Spring Hill fire that burned uh, the New Jersey Pine Plains primarily. Um, and we still have about a thousand ignitions a year um, statewide, but most are in the New Jersey Pine Barrens. Um, there's a lot of people that, that live in the Pine Barrens as well and, and on the edges of the Pine Barrens and, and tick-borne diseases are, are quite important there. These are just some uh, pictures of the different ticks that we have in New Jersey. Um, the black-legged tick or the deer tick in the upper left here is, is the most uh, well-known tick probably perhaps followed by the lone star tick or the dog tick, um, which all vector um, some different diseases. There's also a new tick that I think because of coronavirus and a, a lack of ability to really conduct much research, we haven't heard too much about this year, but Asian longhorn tick um, really just arrived fairly recently. Uh, there have been a lot of cases in New Jersey um, we're not sure, it doesn't seem to vector anything terrible to humans in the United States right now, um, but um, it does reproduce really fast, um, about a thousand at a time, and uh, they can really infest wildlife and livestock quite quickly. The other thing I'll point out to you here in this slide is that, um, you know, Probably before I started studying ticks, I would have just said, yeah, yeah, there's like four pictures of black-legged tick and there's four pictures of these other ticks, but like, why are there four pictures? And I, I would really kind of just blow past it. But it's what's actually interesting is that these different um, pictures are the different life cycle stages of each tick. And ticks are kind of complicated in their life cycle stages, um, but maybe they're kind of like people. Um, you know, so so we'd start off on the on the right here with a tiny larva tick, and that would grow into a nymph, and either an adult male or female. Some ticks have multiple nymphal stages. Um, the ones in these pictures only have uh, one, um, but the larva um, are are the most sensitive, um, and then uh, they'll they'll have one time of year where they're they're really peaking towards the fall. Um, and then the nymphs and adults will have uh, other times of years dependent on the species and, and life cycle stages of when they're peaking. So what's important to know is that 
larva don't really carry diseases typically unless they're transmitted from their, their parents through the egg, which is really uncommon. Um, but since they haven't eaten anything yet, they really don't carry too many diseases. The other important thing is that um, the adult males aren't really usually out looking for, for a meal because they're not going to lay eggs. So when we're studying them, we can really focus a lot on the nymphs that would have a lot of disease, um, because if we're looking for disease, would be the nymphs or the adult females. So for our, our study, we focused um, on an area of the Pine Barrens that's about 20 miles wide by about 10 miles tall. And uh, we focused our study on 27 stands of pitch pine forest that had been um, either burned or not burned. Um, so we were comparing burned conditions with unburned conditions. And each one of our sites consisted of a 7.3 meter radius uh, research plot, which is uh, here on the right, you can see. And in those plots, we evaluated if the site had been burned, um, whether it was an annual prescribed burn site or it was a, a fire reintroduction since the reintroduction of fires is a big deal in a lot of the Northeast considering we, we've lost a lot of fire. And talking about the quality of fire, again, we assessed whether the fire was of low severity, moderate severity, or high severity. And if you look at my diagram on the right here, you can see that the, um, the pane on the left is an unburned patch of forest. The, uh, the next one to the right is a low severity burn. And you can see there's still green needles in the canopy, but the forest floor is burnt. The next pane to the right shows a burned forest um, with a lot more scorch on the trees, and all the yellows, uh, all the yellows, all the needles have been um, damaged because they're yellow, but they weren't consumed by the fire. And then on the right, um, that panel shows a forest that had a high severity fire. All the foliage in the canopy has been consumed. All of the fine fuels, all of the, the leaves and small twigs have been consumed. It's really been cleaned out quite a bit and, and changed. Um, and we evaluate burn severity using, um, there's actually a standard uh, field sheet that we can use to quantify different attributes of the forest. And basically we number them up, sum up the numbers of these different qualities. And uh, depending on that number, it'll determine objectively what the uh, burn severity for that site is. We also looked at the vegetation structure. Um, we looked at the, the macro structure, so the, the actual canopy um, and, and how dense the forest was um, in the canopy as well as in the shrub layer. And we looked at how um, thick the litter and duff layers were as well. And so, to take a, a little step back here, that's important because if you're a tick, your, your biggest problem in the world after getting a, a blood meal for food is desiccation or drying out. And so um, litter and duff or the organic matter uh, at the top of the soil is really important because it holds moisture and uh, provides refugia for ticks um, when they need to rehydrate. Shrubs are also really important because um, they actually provide vertical habitat for ticks that are looking for hosts. So um, if there's nothing for them to climb on, they have a lot less uh, opportunity to interact with a, um, a deer or a human coming through the woods or some other wildlife. Um, and, and shrubs also will really help manage that moisture um, scenario um, in the forest. So um, we also looked at some of those conditions too. So the temperature and humidity um, at the forest floor in those plots. Um, we used this little sensor on the right. It was an autonomous temperature and humidity sensor in this little um, homemade um, uh, radiation shield. So it kept the sunlight off of the sensor um, so it didn't artificially heat it up. And we left those sensors out for the past two years now um, in our plots. Um, to look at how those conditions of temperature and humidity might vary between these different types of burns. 
And then of course we did our tick surveys. And so we used a couple different methods to capture ticks. Um, we used uh, dragging and sweeping um, with a, a, a cloth, which I'll show a little video of in a moment. Um, and we brought those ticks back to our laboratory. Um, we collected them off the cloth with actually a lint roller. Um, so if you're into going out in the woods or um, even the Albany Pine Bush Preserve and you wanna be extra careful for ticks, having a lint roller handy um, is a really great cheap way to um, make sure you don't bring them home with you um, and to get them off you quickly. But we would take them off those lint rollers and uh, we'd preserve them in ethyl alcohol. And every one of our ticks has been cataloged, photographed and identified and, um, and now uh, analyzed in a laboratory for uh, some genetic markers for diseases. So here's a little video of me doing um, drag sampling. So we take this cloth and we go through the shrubs, um, over the top of the shrubs, and wave that cloth along the tops of the shrubs, just beating gently, um, and then take a look and see if any ticks have latched on. In a, um, a plot that doesn't have many ticks, you might not catch any um, with a single drag. Um, in a plot that has a lot of ticks, a lot of larvae, we've caught probably over 500 um, after um, a sampling like you just saw there. There's a second method that we use also in every plot that's similar, um, that's called sweeping. And if you took that, um, that flag that's in the, this video here and you turned it vertical and stuck it down between the shrubs and walked through the forest, kind of like you're sweeping a floor, that's how we reduce sweeping. Um, and that just samples a different vertical profile of the um, shrub layer. We used both because the jury's kind of out on which is better um, or more appropriate to sample. There's some other sampling methods as well that we didn't use, um, but these seemed like the best for what we were trying to get. We also did our sampling um, three times. So we've, we've been doing this for two years now and we sample in um, a period uh, between May and June, August and September, and um, the beginning of October. And that time was intended to correspond with the time of year that um, the black-legged tick, uh, um, different, that's different um, life cycle stages were most prominent in the forest. So we wanted to get a measure of each um, component of, of the tick population, each life cycle um, throughout the year, um, thinking that some might be impacted differently than others. And then uh, with all of our samples, as I mentioned, uh, we, we did catalog them all. They've all been photographed um, so that we can uh, back up our assessment of, of how many of each species we, we've got. Um, and then we saved them and have done this qPCR analysis, which is a genetic analysis um, of, of what the ticks had inside of them as far as diseases go. And so we're through the 2019 samples and we're not quite through the 2020 samples uh, so far. So here's some results of how fire can impact the forest. This is a, um, a LIDAR uh, rendering of a forest. So we have a laser-based unit that looks like um, a coffee can just about, and we can put it out on a tripod and it'll spin around and um, it's like a laser range finder on steroids. And it will measure the distances of anything it hits. And if you put all that together, you get a nice three-dimensional rendering. If, if we had the software open, I could spin these pictures around and we could explore um, the, uh, the forest. What you can see in these pictures, these are from two of our different sites at two different cranberry companies. Um, they were generous enough to let us use their forest, which was nice because we didn't have to worry about anyone tampering with or stealing our um, sensors. You can see that um, uh, with the Coex and Cranberry Company panel here on the left, the, the picture on the left is of an annual burn plot that's been burned annually since at least the 1950s. And then on the right, there's a fire excluded area. And so you can really see the structure of the forest is much denser in the fire excluded area. The tree structure is different. Um, the canopy is closer to the shrub layer and the shrub layer is closer to the canopy. And then if we 
look at the Lee Brothers panel over here on the right, we can see pretty much the same pattern um, where there's, there's much less space um, in the canopy and the shrubs are, are much taller in the fire excluded area compared to the annual burn plot. And I'm highlighting this because there aren't too many places um, that really burn annually. Uh, in New Jersey, it's only the cranberry farms and that was to protect the, the cranberry um, crops. Um, I believe that there's some uh, annual prescribed burning at the Albany Pine Bush Preserve, which is pretty neat. Um, but otherwise, there aren't too many places that really burn annually. So this is a, a really interesting, unique condition um, that's been highlighted in some other places as being important ecologically to maintain um, certain herbaceous species and, and wildlife habitat. Um, I apologize for throwing a, a graph up here. Um, but uh, it is kind of interesting. Basically, this is looking at the forest microstructure and um, what these different figures show is that um, on the uh, bottom axis or at the bottom of the graph, we can see each box relates to um, a burn severity class, whether the, the site was unburned, low, moderate, or high severity fire. And basically, as you go from an unburned condition to a high severity condition, the average shrub height decreases, the average litter depth decreases, and for the most part, the average depth or organic matter at the top of the soil also decreases. So each of those conditions are important to ticks. The more shrub material you have, the more litter you have, the more duff you have, the more moisture laden that environment will be, the more structure there is for them to crawl around in, um, the better environment it probably will be for them. So um, just that's that's just really interesting to see um, how prominent uh, the fire effects are on those different components of their habitat. And here's another graph, and it's it's kind of the same thing, um, but opposite. So now we're looking at some of our temperature results. So we measured temperature, we took a, a sample every five minutes um, for the past two years in these sites. And uh, these represent growing season temperatures, so um, really June through September. And what we see is that the unburned site, um, which is here uh, at the, the box on the lower left, is that little black line is right around 26 degrees centigrade. If we go over and look at the high severity box um, on the other side of this first graph, it's almost up at 30. So it's almost, it's about four or five degrees hotter in a high severity plot on average um, during the growing season in the burned areas. It's the same thing if we look at the maximum daytime temperature. So that's the average, but the peak temperature during the day in an unburned area can get as hot as 45 degrees centigrade, whereas in the uh, high severity plots, it's about 15 degrees hotter or so, um, upwards of 60 degrees centigrade uh, right near the ground. So that's a huge temperature differential that'll really dry out that environment and, and create a stressful condition if you're just a little tiny poor tick um, trying to get by in the, the wild world or the forest out there. And to correspond with that, we see the opposite trend with humidity. <clears throat> so in um, on the left side of this graph, we can see that that black line of an unburned site, the average unburned site tends to be about 80% humidity um, during the day in June to September. Um, but a high severity plot is about, again, 15% uh, lower. If we look at the minimum, so that's just the average, but if we look at the minimum daytime humidity, um, it goes from about 30% in an unburned plot all the way down below 20 to about 17% um, at its lowest point in the day. And you have to realize that a tick doesn't have a whole lot of opportunity to buffer its day um, like maybe a person would. You know, we can be thirsty for a while. We've got a lot of water and moisture inside of us. Um, but a rapid change in conditions um, or, a, or a long change could only mean um, a hot, dry period for, for an hour or so um, to really be rough for a tick. Um, so now we can look at some of the data about how, how the ticks we captured varied um, 
across our study. So we did sampling on the, um, in June, August, and October. This is a 2019 data. We're not quite done getting our 2020 data together. And the red box indicates an unburned condition. The green box indicates a, a low severity condition. Blue box indicates a moderate severity condition. And the purple box indicates a high severity condition. So going left to right for each month, we're going from unburned to low to moderate to high. And what we can see here is, is kind of a, a loose trend that the, tick, the numbers of ticks captured decline as severity increases, which is what we expected. Um, it gets a little messy in October because we're, we're having um, a lot of larva um, in our plots. So some of these plots, would have 500 larvae here and maybe 100 there, and it, it just got a lot messier. Um, this year was the second year after burning, and basically these trends were very similar, um, where, where we saw for the second year in a row after burning that uh, the ticks were declining uh, proportional to the severity, or, or had still remained declined with proportion to the severity. So the numbers really haven't gone up in the past uh, two years after burning. We also compared our methods, dragging versus sweeping. And uh, I think I feel pretty validated that we did both methods. Um, as you can see in, in June, we caught more ticks with the drag method, um, but in October, the orange, the bigger orange proportion indicates that we, we caught more ticks with the sweep method. And in August, it was, it was about 50-50. So I think to do an objective um, research study, not necessarily just a, um, maybe a, a, a study that you do for yourselves um, or I would do just out of interest, but for a research study, doing both of these methods actually seems to be a pretty good way to ensure that you're getting a representative sample of tick populations. Uh, this graph is a little bit busy, but basically the point of this figure is that every month of the year, we have found more, way, way more Ameri um, Amblyoma americanum or Lone Star ticks in across the whole area that we studied than any other tick. Um, so that was really surprising because we actually based our study on the timing of um, deer ticks. and uh, in fact, we found almost no deer ticks in the pine barrens. Um, I wouldn't say we didn't find any, um, but uh, there just there just aren't that many there. Um, and uh, but there are a ton of Lone Star ticks. So um, we tested the Lone Star ticks uh, using that PCR. Um, method uh, up at the Rutgers Center for Vector Biology in New Brunswick. And our collaborator, uh, Andrea Giese, was really kind to, to donate um, a lot of time and, and um, some technical time to analyzing the ticks. And so um, what we found were that the Lone Star ticks had, were carrying pretty much three different diseases. Um, the first one, they're all uh, abbreviated here on the, the top, um, row, um, but uh, Rickettsia amblyomatis um, was the, uh, the first one that had, that had the most uh, prevalence, followed by um, Orichia chapsiensis and Orichia uh, uingii. Um, so these are the three different diseases. We really didn't find anything else in our lung star ticks. Um, and the highest prevalence of diseases were in our adult ticks, which makes sense because they fed an extra time. So they have an extra opportunity to pick up a disease from um, a wildlife host. Um, nymphs also had pretty similar uh, disease rates, um, but altogether um, around 32% of the ticks were carrying something. Um, and, and a few ticks, not many, had, had more than one disease. Um, so just because, you know, 32% um, of the ticks were carrying something doesn't mean that there's a 32% chance that you're gonna catch something 
if you got bitten by a tick. It takes time to transmit these diseases. Um, and uh, not every tick is gonna be carrying one. So there's not much research on really what the probability of, of an infection would be. Um, but these are some interesting numbers to, to work with um, as a baseline. Um, let's see here. So another interesting thing, the big question at hand is gonna be, well, did prescribed fire reduce the, the tick-borne diseases? Um, and I guess you could say, yes, um, the, the plots that had the lowest amount of ticks were the high severity and the annual burn plots. And there actually weren't enough ticks to actually um, objectively sample the disease prevalence. So we caught so few ticks in the high severity and yeah, annual burn sites um, compared to the other types of sites where we, where we had um, quite a few. There were, I think there were only 24 um, in the uh, annual burn plot. And so it was really hard to, to uh, determine if that was enough ticks. But by numbers, you could just say, well, there are less ticks, so there are less, there's less disease there. Um, so one piece that we didn't really uh, explore in the study that, that could be quite important, that we think is really important, is, is the wildlife component. And wildlife also change uh, how they use the forest quite a bit with fire, um, whether it's been burned or unburned. It ch changes their hiding area, it changes their food sources, it changes their predator dynamics, um, and it changes the structure of the, the, the forest that they're brushing up against where, where ticks um, live. And so, like I said before, if, if you're going through, you know, the proverbial scrub oak car wash, ever, like all day long as a deer walking through the forest, um, you've got a lot more chance of, of picking up um, uh, a parasite, parasitic um, critter um, than if, like a tick, than, than if you're just walking through um, maybe heavily burned shrubs that are only ankle deep. Um, you just have much more surface area contacting the vegetation. Um, <clears throat> also, that, that really can impact how things like rodents, um, you know, use landscapes um, for, for hiding and whatnot. There's been some research that shows that in, in more open canopy areas, um, rodents, uh, we spend a lot more time hiding and grooming themselves than um, foraging. And so... The idea there would be that if they're spending a lot more time um, stressing about uh, a predator, they're not moving around as much. Um, but um, so yeah, just um, I guess just to recap that um, with all these changes um, for all these these attributes, um, you know, mosquito ranges are also changing. Tick ranges are changing. Um, things are moving north. Um, you know, there's a lot of changes going on and all these things are going to impact our, um, our, the wildlife, um, communities that, that carry these diseases and, and then the ticks that, uh, transmit them to us. So, um, there's really not a whole lot of research, uh, published right now that I'm aware of about fire and wildlife in the Northeast. But these figures uh, are of data from the Southeast where there's been more research. And basically um, there's less deer use of areas in the Southeast and pine forests that have been recently burned. So uh, deer use increases with time since fire. Also the deer group size of, um, of a, a group of deer increases with time since fire. Um, the way turkeys use prescribed burned areas uh, can change with uh, prescribed fire. So uh, turkeys um, use the fire, use the burned area less um, in the first few months after it's been burned than, than later on. And um, we don't think about turkeys a whole lot, but they are a um, alternate reservoir species for, um, I forget which disease it is. I believe it's one of the Earl Riches. Um, that we don't really think about, but turkey populations have changed dramatically in the Northeast um, in recent decades. Um, 
And so that, that might be something to investigate as well. Um, also, uh, turkey poults tend to have uh, far fewer ticks on them in burned areas than, than unburned areas. So we're still working on this study. Um, we've got a paper that we're um, gonna resubmit uh, shortly to um, ecological applications. It's a, a literature review on how fire um, in the United States uh, may have previously impacted tick populations in historic times and how the restoration of fire dependent landscapes could be a potential way to um, help reduce the growing burden of ticks um, in, in the, the areas we live. Um, so for this study though, I, I think we've, we've pretty definitively found that within at least the first two years, um, fire has a pretty strong reduction, reducing impact on tick populations. Um, on average, the reduction was, um, I believe across any kind of burn um, condition was about 50%. Um, the, the high severity plots had um, upwards of a, a 95% um, reduction in ticks. And the low severity plots, I believe, had uh, somewhere around a 40% reduction on average. Um, the long-term uh, impacts, though, uh, are probably uh, also linked to species um, and microclimate. And we did find that, um, you know, that there were some pretty profound vegetation and microclimate changes that would really help explain, at least in the, the short term of our study, why some of these tick populations um, have actually gone down, why mechanistically um, they would change with fire. Um, and then we also found that, that the two uh, capture techniques that we use are actually probably shouldn't be uh, compromised using one or the other, but, but that they're both probably appropriate to use together. So just to recap, um, you know, fire really does impact uh, a lot of different factors that impact tick populations, either directly or indirectly. Um, and so, you know, in the Northeast, prescribed fire is, is really the biggest uh, probably source of fire um, that we have. And it's, it's really a, a cost-effective and, uh, you know, a, a quick cost-effective way that we can manage a, a large area of land for ecological benefit, um, but maybe also for uh, public health benefit too, um, if, if we can reduce ticks through that. So um, I'm looking forward to, to um, really getting into our data this winter. Um, and uh, one of our, our collaborators has been out on leave for a little bit, but they should be back shortly. And then we're, uh, we're pretty excited to go. Um, pretty strong at this um, and put it together. So um, this is, uh, is, I just wanted to highlight some of our team. Um, these are all students who've been working on the project. Uh, Alexis Everland is my full-time technician. Um, she actually works for Tall Timbers Research Station. Um, she's gonna go on to do a PhD at Rutgers um, next year. Uh, Julia DeFeo, is a uh, Rutgers undergraduate who's worked part-time and uh, her and Lexi have been just incredible uh, technicians on this project. I, I can't say enough um, about how much time and dedication and care they've put into to collecting really good samples and really being organized about the data and um, you know going out of their way to, to really read up extra on methods and things. Um, so, so that's great. Julie's going to go on to a PhD program next year as well. And um, uh, Nathaniel Schmidt is a master's student at uh, Penn State. Um, and, um, you know, his, his uh, experience um, just uh, working on the side in a uh, veterinary clinic was, was really valuable in helping us design our study. Too. So I also want to thank um, a number of our different partners that gave us permission to work on our land. So this is a, a, a really good example of what I'd call co-production in science or, or managers and scientists working together from the start. So um, 
our partners at New Jersey Forest Fire Service, they're the, the fire management agency for the state, um, really helped us identify excellent sites uh, that met our needs, that, that would be safe for our equipment and um, that we get permission on. So some of those included uh, private property at the Lee Brothers Cranberry Company or Moore's Meadows Cranberry Company, um, Quexon Cranberry Company. Um, each of those uh, private uh, landowners owns um, about a thousand or more acres and, and was really generous to let us come onto their property um, and, and really give us um, a lot of flexibility to come in and out when we needed to do this research. Um, and then I also have to thank uh, New Jersey Conservation Foundation and New Jersey Natural Lands Trust um, for, for really being kind to, and also giving us um, permission to set up our, our plots on their properties. Um, and then these are just some of our um, partner institutions uh, that the collaborators are, are part of. So with that, um, I'd be happy to take some questions. All right. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we um, do have some me, questions. Okay. Um, so, oh, do you want me to read them to you or? Um, sure. Okay. Uh, Richard says, are there any other dynamics besides weather that affect or control tick populations or can they just keep growing? Yeah, there's, um, <clears throat> well, all right. So I'll preface this by saying that I'm, I'm, I'm recent to the tick, um, the studying ticks. So I, I don't know for sure all the different things that influence tick populations. Um, winter temperatures, I guess that's weather, but, but cold winters um, seem like they can be damaging to tick populations. There's also uh, predator arthropods that, that will go after ticks um, in the soil layer. So there's, there's a predator prey dynamic even within uh, tick populations. Um, and then certainly, well, I don't know a whole lot about it. And I think that there's a need for more research, definitely these wildlife dynamics, um, which have changed a lot in, I know New Jersey and Pennsylvania, and I imagine New York, um, just which populations are, are on booms and which ones are on busts. Different wildlife populations, um, different, different species are what we call reservoirs for tick-borne diseases. So um, a deer, for instance, is a reservoir for Lyme disease. Um, a tick bites a deer and it has Lyme disease and it transmits the Lyme disease to the deer. Then that Lyme disease is there within the deer for the next tick to come along and pick up. Um, but other wildlife species don't uh, hold Lyme disease or, or um, if it's a different disease, they don't all hold it um, so that another species can then pick it up. So uh, that species dynamic again is, is really important uh, because some species are more important than others. And uh, even if you have a species that seems less important at one time, maybe if it's in a population boom, um, just by sheer numbers, it, it, it could become more important. And they're, they're not just transmitting uh, diseases, but they're, they're moving ticks around. So in our plots that were uh, the most high severity plots, um, I think, let me see if I can scroll back here to a picture um, I had here. So this picture on the bottom right, there really were like, just a handful of ticks that we'd find every now and then. We'd find an adult tick every now and then, um, and what we at, at, at odd times of year. And what we think were that they were they were coming in um, on a host, and they'd drop off into this site. They'd come in out of some unburned area on a host, drop in. But we don't think that they were really actually surviving in there very well because this site has um, you know just very little cover. It dries out really quickly now that there's no pine needles in there, um, it's starting to grow back, but um, it just became a, a, a really harsh environment for something like a tick. Um, so um, those are 
those are some of the dynamics there. But but like I said, there's also um, I don't know a whole lot about them, but I do know that there are other uh, arthropods uh, around the litter layer and the soil layer that 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 do go after ticks as well. So there's there's a lot of dynamics that uh, that impact their population. Awesome. Uh, Jacobs Jacob says, did you sweep and drag the same areas or did each section have their own method? I.e., would you drag one area and then sweep it? No. So we, we thought about that. We, we kept it. So each we drag, we did drags and sweeps in each plot um, and we did them uh, for a few days a month and we wouldn't repeat the same transect in the plot within a given month. Um, so basically we, we would have different bearings from plot center that we'd walk out to, to do our drag or sweep. And if we did it on one, you know, one bearing the first time, then we'd move over and do it a different bearing the next time. So we weren't just sampling the same spot within the plot, but we were trying to get a comprehensive area across the whole plot um, at least once a month. Um, and, and we did do both. So we'd walk out with the drag and back with the sweep. Um, and I don't think it really made a, you know, I, I think if you were doing grass, maybe there'd be a difference, but in a forest setting, it didn't really seem like one was actually better for the other, better than the other. Um, my guess was that the, uh, the sweeping, which is getting down into the litter layer would be better um, just because it, it would, it might get some ticks that were hiding out in the litter layer better. But in reality, um, there just wasn't really any correlation that we found one being better than the other, other than the time of year that we did it. Um, so hopefully that, that helps a little bit. Okay. Zach asks, how did you go about starting this study? How did you obtain funding and find researchers to collaborate with? Was it a lengthy process? No. Um, so uh, most of our studies involve a big grant. And this one involved uh, a $25,000, which is a really small grant for research, um, grant, um, internal grant from Penn State. And actually all of the funding for like, the bulk of the funding for this was just actually uh, just pilfered from other projects that we we're working on. Um, so there wasn't actually any funding that we could find available to apply for. And um, so like I, I said, I, I started this project with my a colleague and a, and a good friend, Jesse Cry, and together we were out giving some presentations at a meeting in Albuquerque um, uh, a while ago. and, and um, you know, we, he, he had just gotten this job at Penn State. And we wanted to work on something together. And, you know, this is not how it typically goes, but, um, you know, maybe it's kind of like, you know, you, like some music star tells a story about how, like, you know, his hit song, he just kind of like hummed up on the train going somewhere and didn't really think much of it. And then it all worked out. Like, you know, we came up with this idea, um, you know, really, on like this trip over a couple beers. And, uh, and then we realized that, well, we'd have to start it right away when we got back because of the, the seasonality of these different tick life, life cycle stages. And so we just kind of, um, but like our, our, our drags are all um, made of broom handles uh, or mop handles. So, so there's no more mop handles at, <laughs> at my research station. We uh, are not during field season. Um, and, and the cloth was like from the discount rack at um, uh, the, the fabric store. Um, but uh, some of the other equipment that we used, we, we just had, um, and, and it all worked out really well. Um, you know, compared to some other stuff with the sensors and whatnot. So the 25,000 went to buy the sensors, um, the, the, young ladies that are working on the project were already working for me on some other stuff. Nathan was already working with Jesse. Um, Andrea was a, a, somebody I knew from graduate school. And uh, we've had a, a relationship with the land managers for since before I started with the research station. So 
it just was a um a really opportunistic um way of i guess leveraging just what we had sounds very serendipitous <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Don asks, in a moderately burned area, what is the time frame of protection from ticks? In a moderately burned area? Well, so far, um, we've continued to see a reduction two years out. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't say that you were, um, you know, it's totally safe to go out there carefree. It certainly isn't. But, um, you know, across all of our plots, we continue to see a reduction the same reduction pretty much um, as the first year in through the second year. Um, so I would say for our environment, two, two years at least, um, you'll see a, a meaningful reduction. Not a, like I said, not an entire reduction, but, but a, a pretty pro prolific one. All right, Neil says, great presentation, Mike. Any indication that fire size has an effect on tick abundance over time? Oh, that's a really good question, Neil. Um, thanks for asking that one. So yeah, um, we didn't study that at all in this, in this project. And uh, we, we don't, I think we actually would need some funding um, if we're gonna do more like that. But that's a really great question because um, there is some research, not on ticks, but on other wildlife, um, how they use burn sites um, and, and where they, they distribute themselves. So if you've got like a really small patch of forest, say, you know, an acre that you burn um, that's surrounded by other unburnt forest, uh, that kind of becomes like the wildlife buffet. Everything was going to come in there and check it out. Um, because it's different and they're going to just hammer it and eat everything just because it might not even be better, but, but the trend is that, um, you know, it's, it's a buffet. So everything's just going to go in there and hammer it. But if you burn say a thousand acres, um, like it, it's kind of like maybe people at a flea market, like nobody really knows where to start or stop and everybody kind of browses a lot. There's just so much to cover and everybody wants the best thing um, or the most interesting thing. And wildlife seem to kind of do the same thing with, with their, their browsing in the forest. And so they'll actually spend a lot more time kind of wandering around, um, checking out for, for good things to eat than just staying in, in one place and hammering a particular area. What, what's been found out um, in the Rocky Mountain area with elk is that they seem to hang out mostly along the edge though. And it takes them in a, in a really big burned area, it takes them longer to um, really spend a lot more time back in the middle. And so getting back to that wildlife component, um, if, if ticks have to hitchhike back in there, um, you know, on, on some kind of critter, um, that, that fire size might become really important, um, you know, for that. Uh, the other thing there too is that the wildlife are impacting the vegetation layer in that periphery more than they would on the inside. And so this study out in the Rocky Mountain area was showing how the elk were actually eating all the, uh, the, the tree sprouts, all the, the um, aspen sprouts on the outside, but the aspen on the inside was regenerating a lot more and the vegetation on the inside could regenerate more. So. Um, there's just this really interesting spatial pattern in that comes up with fire and fire size um, and, and how wildlife use sites. Um, you know, it, it's kind of complicated, but I just think it's fascinating. Um, Very cool. <laughs> if anybody's got any funding out there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, we have an anonymous question. Um, based on your data, it seems like a high severity prescribed fire is the most effective prescribed fire to decrease the tick population. Is there potential concern for the biodiversity of the forest if a state hypothetically implements this as a strategy to manage the tick population? Well, yes. Um, you wouldn't want to burn everything uh, like the like the plot in the bottom left here. And uh, 
although the high severity reduced ticks quite a bit, um, the annual burn um, scenario actually reduced ticks quite a bit as well. Um, it was actually the second most. I didn't include that in my figure. I don't think I didn't break it out, but but that actually had that was low severity, but it actually had the um, a, a really high reduction, um, the second highest reduction in ticks of, of the different types of uh, burns. I guess the other thing to consider too is that um, you know it, it's probably unlikely that we're going to be managing the forest just for ticks. Um, so I, I think that the benefit here is that different types of fire achieve different management goals. Um, for instance, if you're trying to reduce fuel to prevent a uh, catastrophic wildfire, maybe repeated low intensity fire um, is, a, is a safe long-term method to get there. Um, but maybe you wanna mix up a different area for some habitat diversity or to create some snags. Um, uh, or just to clean out the forest rapidly. Um, there's a very different forest structure that comes from repeated prescribed fire than an intense wildfire um, or, or just a really intense prescribed fire. So I think the, the benefit here is that we can get a tick reduction, some kind of tick reduction that's meaningful from um, just about any type of fire implementation, at least in these pine forests that we've been studying. Um, and so there's, there's just this great uh, added benefit, I think, that can go along with, with other types of management goals. Um, I think this might be the same person, I'm not sure. They said, is there potential concerns for adaptation from the prescribed fires for the tick population? Hmm, like ticks adapting to prescribe fires. I would say it's probably, I'm not, again, I'm, I'm not a tick expert, um, but considering the research down south, so there's a lot of prescribed fire, like way more prescribed fire down south than anywhere else in the country, really. Um, they burn things quite a bit. And, um, you know, they have for, for a long time and, I mean, I don't think that there's any noticeable change. There's examples of places that have burned. I guess, I guess my point is that there's examples of other places that have burned quite a lot. Um, so at least it's, I don't see any difference with the tick adaptation. You know, I, I guess, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really impractical. You can't burn everything all the time everywhere. Um, it just it just doesn't work. You, there's going to be weather conditions that are going to get in the way. You're going to have restrictions on on burn windows um, that are are legal restrictions that are going to be really tough to impossible to change. And maybe even a day that you can burn, maybe you're going to have really bad winds that you're going to smoke out the highway or or the nursing home down the road. So there's a lot of challenges to when you can implement a burn, some of them are, are human challenges, but other ones are just the weather. Um, you know, during our burn window in New Jersey, for instance, there's there's often really only, you know, maybe two weeks out of the, the burn window that are actually good burn days um, where, where smoke and other things won't be an issue. So, um, you know, I'm not sure that we need to burn that we would need to burn everywhere, but but maybe um, this is something that could be a strategic focus um, for certain certain types of areas, or um, you know where where ticks might be an issue. Um, and and yeah, I, th I think I'll stop there. But but um, I guess just those are some of the, the there's some constraints on on burning and, and what's actually achievable. Okay, Jacob says, did the areas you studied have different hunting laws? Would there be more deer hosts in one area versus another? So everywhere, that's a good question. Um, everywhere that we studied um, was, 
pretty, I'm not going to say really remote, but um, wasn't near a neighborhood. Every, everything was a forest environment. Um, you know, on the cranberry farms, there was a little bit of improvement here and there. Um, but, but all of the plots, for the most part, were, were pretty far away from homes. Um, you know, like, I would think within a deer's range away from a home um, or, a, or a neighborhood area. Um, so I, and, and so as far as hunting goes, the whole area that we studied is hunted probably an even amount. Um, you know, the Pine Burns, I don't know if you think it's big or small, but, but there's people all over the woods um, in, in hunting season, like there's, there's people everywhere. So I, I think it's, I really think it's pretty evenly hunted. Um, you know, but, but that said, I mean, there's, there's deer everywhere also. I mean, they're just, it, it, the woods are crawling with deer. Okay. Um, I think I'm not seeing any more questions, but I have one. Sure. <laughs> um, on your slide, one of your um, early slides where you were showing the, the box and whisker plots of um, the amount of, I'm specifically talking about the um, duff um, with burn severity. Um, the duff seemed to jump up in the high severity burns. Yes. Um, and I was curious if you could talk about that because, I mean, the duff is theoretically where these ticks would be hanging out during the summer months, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's a good question. So, so the duff, I believe in these, sorry, I got to get my uh, zoom box off that figure there. Um, so yeah, so the duff in those plots, um, I mean, there's still not that much. Um, we're talking about, you know, four centimeters, um, maybe. But uh, what I think the difference was in those plots was just kind of a random difference. Uh, the highest severity plots were ones that were, fire was being reintroduced into um, because because it had been excluded. And um, we kind of, it was treated with a mosaic of, of high and low and moderate severity fire across the area. And so the, um, I think, I mean, just that difference I think was, was just kind of random. I mean, even, even the unburned to low, you can see those error bars. There's a lot of, there's a bit of overlap. Um, and even low to moderate, you know, the averages change, but there's so much variability within them. I, I just think that, Basically, I think that the duff doesn't really work out so great until you start to do, and I don't have it in here, um, you know, the annual burning would reduce the duff more. Um, and it just takes time and multiple burns to do that. So um, I don't know if that helps answer your question, but I think I think really what you're seeing in this plot is is more of a just a, a natural um, variability across all these conditions that's that's not that impacted by a single fire. Gotcha. Not, I wasn't not sure. by a dormant season fire because the duff is still damp and the bottom of the leaf litter is still damp. So you're not really actually getting that much fire impact in the dormant season single fire. Um, to that that component. I didn't know if higher severity fires had lower residence time, so maybe they weren't burning the duff as much. Yeah, they that that could be a thing. Um, but the heat that they put out, I mean, the energy that they put out, it might not be a long residence time. But um, there's a I could send you a link. Um, there's a video called "Eye of the Fire" that we we did um, last year in one of these um, high severity burns that was for, for reintroduction of fire and, and to um, mix up the site ecologically. And um, I, it, it's a pretty neat, it's a 360 degree virtual reality um, video. So you can actually, it was taken with a 360 degree camera in a um, fire protected case 
and and so you can actually spin around in the video and look at like what's going on like you're standing there in the fire um and i think if you saw that fire i think it's pretty convincing that that there's quite a lot of heat um and energy and consumption you know it's pretty pretty serious <laughs> That is a really cool, I'm pretty sure I've seen it. I think I've seen it, but that okay. is a very cool video. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We worked with a co colleague at NIST, um, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, um, uh, to make that video. And, and uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, All right. Well, I think we'll let you off the hook. <laughs> okay. Yeah, if you have any more, I mean, if there's more questions, I don't mind oh, answering looks them. Looks like one, one more popped up. Okay. We'll do this one and then we'll, we'll do call one more. It. Um, yeah. L says, how are the maps made that show the different severity of the fire across the landscape? Does it use oh. satellite imagery or measurements that you take or something else? That's a great question. Um, so yeah, that, the, those maps use satellite imagery. That's, that was kind of what my dissertation was on. Um, so it's, it's like one of my favorite things to talk about. But um, we used uh, satellite imagery from, from a satellite called Landsat. Um, We've used Landsat 7 and Landsat 8. And so um, they uh, come around about every two weeks and take another picture of wherever they're flying over. Um, so, you know, they, they orbit um, over New Jersey. They take about four different frames. Um, so it, it kind of goes around the earth and you'll get two of them. And then you kind of got to wait for it to come around again and get the other couple um, because it's not, it, the way it travels in its path. Um, and those uh, images are um, multi spec, they're made with multi spectral um, images. So the satellite actually has multiple cameras on it. For anybody who's, who's not um, familiar with remote sensing, we'll have an array of cameras that are specialized to take pictures of very specific um, bandwidths of light. So uh, some of that light will be bandwidths that we can't see. Some of it will be visible spectrum. For the burn severity um, signal, the near infrared um, and the short wave infrared are the two um, that we really focus on. Um, so for, for Landsat, that would be bands four and seven. And um, they're particularly, those wavelengths of light are particularly sensitive or they're, they're particularly reflected by either green or dead vegetation or brown vegetation or char. And so depending on the, the ratio of that um, reflected light signal, you can get a really good idea that correlates very well with how much char there is, um, how much or how much green needles there are, um, you know, in the forest. And so you can very easily detect the magnitude of change um, for a given area on that. And um, so, so that's that's how we do it. There's another sensor called Worldview Three that we we also have used. Um, and the difference is that I guess an important consideration is that aside from the temporal resolution. The spatial resolution of these sensors can be different. So um, just because it takes pictures doesn't mean it's going to be useful for everything. Um, Landsat <laughs> has a 30 meter by 30 meter pixel size. Um, Worldview 3, um, we got it down to a 7 by 7 meter pixel size. Um, but then there's some other satellites that fly around quite frequently, um, you know, just about daily. Um, but their pixel sizes can be anywhere from 250 meters by 250 meters to like about a kilometer by a kilometer. So you could just think of the Albany Pine Bush Preserve. Um, you know, one of those pixels might be like the whole preserve just about or, or just a couple pixels. And if you've got, you know, um, a 10 acre fire here and a one acre fire there and a 30 acre fire here, um, you know, if your fires are smaller than your pixel is, <clears throat> you're going to lose the signal. <clears throat> and that's, so that's one of the challenges with it. Um, but um, like, you know, there's just challenges like that with everything. There's no one size fits all.
solution. Um, but but like there is that uh, sheet that I mentioned to the um, uh, the burns the CBI field sheet that you can also use to assess severity um, manually in the field in a plot. And that that correlates. It's actually how you want the the primary way of evaluating or validating the satellite um, data. All right. Well, thank you so so much. This has been a really engaging, interesting talk. Um, we've got some comments about excellent program applause. So thank you so very much. Um, uh, did, people did ask about that fire video. So um, sure. maybe I'll talk to you about if we can share that on our Facebook page or something when we post your lecture. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it's, there's, there's plenty of links for it. So that, that would be great. Um, I can send you the link to it. Great. All right. Oh, yeah. Now they're all coming in. Everybody says, thank you. Excellent presentation. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mike. Very interesting talk. And oh. I, hope you, I hope the rest of your research goes well. Thank so, you very much. I hope to get hope hope to get back up to the Albany pine bush sometime uh, when it when that's a, a thing again because it's a great place up there. I really enjoy it. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Have a good yeah, night. Yeah, you too.